So Sue is is actually uh, the name is really interesting for me personally because um, the name is stuck and the title of the book is actually about these these kind of cognitive biases these kind of forces that sway us that sway our behaviors that sway our actions and decisions without sometimes even realizing about it and um, and it's based or in a lot of my academic research so my PhD was all about technology and bias and about how uh, the the myth of the objectivity of technology and how it depends on the bias of the person who's collecting the data the machine learning algorithms are biased and those kind of things about technology but throughout from there um, i started exploring other things about um, about how biases manifest in other areas of our life as well. So obviously it's based in my personal experiences as well as a woman, as a woman of color, as somebody growing up in India, and then coming to the UK as, as an immigrant, um, being um, the first woman lecturer appointed in one of the um, top five engineering departments in the UK, um, not just women of color, but also the first woman being appointed. And so all those kind of things shaped the book as well so i do draw in on the personal experiences but it's based a lot in my own research but also the kind of whole interdisciplinary research that was going on around in this area and my work has always been very multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary so i wanted to tie all these strands together in research because otherwise different fields don't talk to each other and also kind of bring in um contemporary case studies and examples from popular media and everything to show how insidious some of these biases can be. Um, so these are some of the just of some of the quotes from for the book. Um, in terms of talk in this this talk, uh, what I want to do is is just um, kind of an introduction about what is unconscious bias, why should we worry about it, and what do we do about it really. Um, and and as there is, as I talk about in the book as well, but there has been so many conversations around unconscious bias in the last few years, especially in the last three years, maybe four years. I did a whole a kind of a social media analysis of how many times it had been mentioned on Twitter over a certain period while I was writing the book, and it was really mind blowing. But I also realized that there were so many myths around it. And there's a real danger that it can become like a trendy word or a buzzword or like a fluff word, which people start ignoring without actually understanding what it is. There's also these myths that if you have unconscious bias, you're not accountable or responsible for them. And that is something I wanted to disrupt in this book as well. Um, and I also wanted to make this book kind of a non-preachy, non-judgmental, because when we talk about bias, suddenly people get really defensive about it. And all of us want to think that we are fair-minded, we are egalitarian, we, do, we, are, we don't carry any biases. Um, of course, I'm not biased. That's what people's first reaction would be. But through this book, I wanted to show that I am biased, and so are you. Everybody is biased. We all carry these biases within us. and and. It's so it was kind of a create this non-judgmental space in this book where through bringing in all this research and examples and data and case studies, we start reflecting on our own biases and prejudices as well. We start understanding how st stereotypes are formed, how these biases that we have can turn into prejudices and discrimination, what kind of impact they can have on, on real people in real world. And so I think that that has been my main aim with the book. It's not not a blueprint for you to step by step process of telling you how you can eradicate or cure your biases and anybody who does that is actually fooling you because nobody can really cure your biases but what we can do and the hope is that we by acknowledging them accepting them understanding them more and being more open-minded upon about them we can start slowly minimizing them. We can start being aware of them when they're impacting our decisions, especially some really important decisions. And so I think that is really the main hope about talking about unconscious biases. I wanted to start with this quote because it just kind of shows, and this is something that can impact all of us. And especially if you work with children, you're an educator or a parent or a carer, 
Um, and we talk about gender bias so much and we think, oh, there is gender equality. Girls and boys have the same opportunity. But this is a really good example of how sometimes the messages that people, children might get might impact on their understanding of their place in the world. They might start thinking that because they are not as many girl protagonists in books, because they are marketed differently, girls are seen to be doing different things. They are not the ones going out and doing action and taking and initiatives. They are not the ones who are out in the forefront in children's books. They are not, boys are not reading. Boys might think I shouldn't read a book with a girl as the central character. It all gives out these messages to young children that girls and boys are not equal in some way. And I think that's the root of the biases. And that's to show that these biases start early. These kind of prejudices can start early as well. And throughout the book, I actually use the term implicit and unconscious bias quite interchangeably. And I refer to these biases as the ones that exist without a conscious knowledge. So there are explicit biases. Like I would say, I am very biased towards pistachio ice cream and I have no worry in saying that. I don't feel anxious when I say that. I don't feel afraid that somebody is going to blame me or accuse me of being biased when I say that. And these are some of the biases that we can just openly say. And there are other explicit biases which we know and we're aware of. But there are some which we either not voice them because we think that that is going to make us look like racist or sexist or ageist or just prejudicial. Or we um, we don't often realize that, but they can just affect the way we talk or we speak or we judge other people as well or we assess and evaluate them. And sometimes they take us completely by surprise. So this this is just to kind of to, sh to say, I think I, I really like making this point at the start because sometimes bias can be a negative word, but biases can be positive as well. We all have a bias towards our children, towards our pets, the people who are close to us, our family, but especially parents and children have this bias, parents have this bias where they often think that they are the cleverest, smartest, most beautiful people on the planet, you know, and that's kind of a nurturing instinct. That's kind of a instinct that people have um, because that's how we are primed um, sometimes. And and that's a positive bias. So biases can always be also be positive. They only become negative if they actually result in them having a then having a negative effect on somebody who's not part of that group that we have a positive bias for. So if it actually leads us to discriminate or be prejudiced against somebody, then that positive bias can be a negative thing as well. So that's, I just wanted to show you the structure of the book and I quite like the some of the titles uh, of the of the book, but also the way the narrative is structured in the book as well. So I start off by talking about our gut instinct and the evolutionary basis of our biases because I wanted to start off there. And also the neuroscience and neurological basis of a bias, what happens in our brains. And sometimes that can feel quite quite scientific, quite quite deep, but it is to actually give a background of how how these biases have been understood through time, how sometimes when media picks up on them and say these biases are hardwired into them, these are kind of genetic biological traits. Why, why that is a myth? Why that is a misunderstanding today? And I think that's what I really wanted to do. And neuroimages is showing our way towards what how biases can be formed in our brains as well. And I recently had an article in Scientific American about it, about how how biases are formed in a brain, what neuroimaging can show us, help us, and what we can do with those results in actually addressing these biases. I talk about stereotypes and I talk about confirmation bias and hindsight bias and some of the other cognitive biases that actually are just kind of we fall back on just while in our daily lives. They might not necessarily result in any kind of prejudice towards any kind of marginalized community or, or vulnerable people. They don't result in active discrimination. And obviously sexism, racism, but I cover a whole range of biases in the book about accents and about looks and height and age, that sometimes these biases can be overlooked and dismissed as well. And sometimes people think that it's, 
it's just biases are just sexism and racism, but it's not that. In fact, there are so many examples in there which show that these are the different kind of biases that affect our dating preferences, how technology is designed. And there's a whole big section about technology. And I'll talk a little bit about that in this talk as well. And the end, I also have a philosophical discussion about some people always tell me that if it's unconscious bias, then am I really responsible for it? And I really wanted to address it from a philosophical moral perspective as well, speaking to a number of philosophers, what they say about it. And obviously, in the end, there is a whole discussion about what is for how we can de-bias, can we minimize these biases at all? So that's to give you an idea of the book. This is an example of the brain, um, uh, the section of the brain. And um, I will not go into too much detail here in, in the talk about it because we can be here all night otherwise. But if you see that thing called little part of the brain at the bottom called amygdala, that is where in a lot of our neuroimaging studies show that when we react to a situation or a person with fear and threat, that's what amygdala is activated. And a lot of our information that's coming into our brain is, is being processed at a very superficial level. And I will show you a slide just now after that. And when it's being processed on a superficial level, we fall back on these stereotypes and templates that exist in our brain already. We don't have time to make a rational decision about this information or to process it rationally. So, um, so then when we react with fear, we react with threat, that's when our biases can sometimes be activated as well. And that is the root of a lot of our biases, this kind of fear of the unknown, fear of unfamiliar, fear related to stereotypes, which we have learned through life as well, the kind of matching it to previous experiences, previous templates. So this is, um, this is an um, um, Alex Honnold, and I don't know if you've seen the the documentary called Free Solo, um, which um, actually um, he's he's he does these really scary climbs without um, without any support, and it really is it, really terrifying. But um, neurobiologist Jay Joseph, he she did a lot of fMRI studies to understand how people react to fear and threat, and when um, they were primed, all the participants were primed with. Uh, images from very kind of scary situations, terrifying situations, and you could see their amygdala being being activated really, really quickly. But when she did the same study with Alex Honnold, she found that um, that she that she that his amygdala didn't activate, and that perhaps showed that amygdala is the part of the brain that is reacting to fear, that is reacting to um, that is reacting to threat. And that's the same kind of fear or threat that happens when we are walking through an unfamiliar alleyway and we hear sound or we hear uh, a person walking towards us. And then we react very instinctively. We, we think that it's a threat to our existence or it's some fearful situation and, and people fall back on these stereotypes. But only when we actually take time to dwell on these situations or these decisions or these responses, then we can realize that perhaps it was just a sound of an owl or somebody, a neighbor and not a fearful or threat, threatening situation. So I think the main message here is that a lot of our instinctive responses can result into biases. Um, a lot of our instinctive responses are based in the notion of being fear, afraid of new or unfamiliar or something that we have been afraid of in the past or that looks like something that we should be afraid of these kind of stereotypes and so um so i think that that the main message is that we need to be aware when we are making these really quick rushed hasty decisions um a lot of the time we are told to trust our own instincts you know we are told that um gut instinct is something we should rely on because that those are our kind of um the feeling in the pit of of our stomach we are told and the first impressions count uh, and we we'll rely so much on our first impressions of others we might think that our gut instinct is just an inner feeling a secret in interior voice and in fact, actually, it's shaped by a perception of something visible around us. 
um, such as a facial expression, a tone of voice, or a visual inconsistency, so fleeting that often we are not even aware that we've noticed it. Psychologists actually think of this moment as a visual matching game. So a stressed, rushed, or a tired person is more likely to resort to this kind of visual matching. When they see a situation in front of them, they quickly match it to a sea of past experiences stored in a mental knowledge bank. And then based on a match, they assign meaning to the information in front of them. The brain then sends a signal to the gut, which has many hundreds of nerve cells. So the visceral feeling we get in the pit of our stomach and the butterflies we feel sometimes are actually a result of our cognitive processing system. So gut instinct can be very useful for making quick decisions in everyday life, but often it can lead to errors that have far-reaching consequences, such as in healthcare, during recruitment, in legal context, in judges, and in policing, as we see as well. Um, police officers sometimes have to make these very quick decisions, and then they might be relying on their gut instinct about a person, and then they are doing a visual matching, which can result in errors as well as we know. So when we use our gut instinct, we are allowing our brain to make quick judgments and we are valuing speed over accuracy. So we are, and so that's this gut instinct where we use emotions to make snap decisions is also called the system one. And this is kind of a dual process theory, which, which is like our intuition. So system one is the unconscious reasoning. It's mostly involuntary and often independent of the working memory, which means that we don't have time to exercise our cognitive rational thinking, and it's rapid, it's more subjective, and it's effortless, um, but it's also very automatic, and it can result in errors. System two is the slower, more controlled, more effort-filled processing, and it's a more rational and logical system. So it's actually detached from emotions and more controlled in that way. And it's because we're making these deliberate decisions, it can be more accurate. Um, system one processing isn't always inaccurate because once we've collected a lot of data through experiences and through learned behaviors, we can actually create a data bank of these memories and experiences, which might result in very accurate judgments and decisions as well. And we know like in healthcare and medical care, doctors and nurses, and, and they have to resort to this kind of processing in a lot of situations. They don't have time to take very slow and controlled and deliberate actions often, often when it's a matter of life and death. So, um, but it can, it is more likely to result in errors when we have an incorrect memory of something. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a machine learning algorithm which has learned from past experiences, but then when it processes the data or information that's coming to us, co coming to it, it can result in inaccuracies as well. So, so we should be aware of the fact that we might be making a system one, we might be putting our system one into place or system two into place when we are making a decision. A lot of our stereotypes are a result of the, the kind of norms that exist in our society. And a lot of prejudices emerge from that as well. So for instance, I like um, really this example of when YouTube designed their video sharing app or the video uploading app initially, um, they found that, um, that a lot of users were uh, put, uploading the video incorrectly. And then they realized that actually they had only accounted for right-handed users. They hadn't even accounted for the left-handed users. They didn't realize that that, that would mean that the, some of the videos with the left-handed users try to operate it, the video, video will be uh, reversed. And so that shows that a lot of technology, products, systems, these kind of decisions that are made are based in the social norm. And right-handed is a norm. A lot of scissors and knives, a lot of products are made for right-handed users. And so this quote is from neurobiologist Daniela Pollock in the New York Times from 2019, where she says, we live in a world where the assumption is that males are the standard the reference population and females are the ones that are odd. And that is where a lot of the roots of sexism lies as well. Gender inequality, because things are designed for men. Um, things are not designed for women often. Decisions are based according to the male prototype. Um, and again, I think when we fall back on these binary categories, there is a danger because often we 
we tread into the kind of biological essentialism that there is this this dichotomy there is a binary uh, categorization of the species um but that is how that is how identity works that's when somebody is perceived to be a man they're more likely to be given prominence and they they are up higher up in the hierarchy and that's that's how society works as well and that's where some of the biases and prejudices are created so um i'm not sure if you remember this example of robert kelly who's an academic he was an associate professor of international relations at Busan National University and he was being interviewed by BBC live um, when two of his children walked into the street uh, into the room and, and a woman of East Asian origin wandered in as well and then um, and it happened quite quickly she dragged them outside and now this is a reality for a lot of us but at that time everybody was surprised the video went viral um, I did a survey at that time soon after that in a lot of Facebook groups uh, with people who are educated, fair minded, who believe in equality, who talk about equality very actively. And uh, out of 250 people who I surveyed, 70 percent said that they thought their first instinct was that she was a nanny. Now she was his wife. And it's it, it shows it's quite a revelation because it shows how we perceive certain ethnicity, how, what kind of norms exist in a society. There is a perception that certain people of certain ethnicities maybe work in subservient roles, maybe work in this kind of caring roles. We also, it also shows how we perceive mixed heritage or mixed uh, race uh, uh, relationships as well. There is an understanding or there is a perception that people will mate with people like them. And that is often true because there is the confirmation bias. We we fall back into a confirmation biases and often we only surround ourselves with people who are like us, who look like us, who act like us, who think like us, who talk like us. And so this this was quite um, this is quite revealing in the way that our norms exist. And sometimes that unconscious bias in those kind that kind of a very quick decision that people made from an initial kind of very, very quick glance shows so much about how we perceive people and judge people and assess people. Um, these are two examples which um, which I found. Um, one I you might be um, aware of uh, when it there was a big debate about it. Um, Professor Tim Hunt, when he said, let me tell you about my trouble with girls. Three things happen when they're in the lab. You fall in love with them. They fall in love with you. And when you criticize them, they cry. He later said that he was joking. And similarly, Chef Marco Pierre White, who's a Michelin star chef, he said in August 2019, just as I was completing the book, I found this quote, um, that the real positive with men in the kitchen is that men can absorb pressure better because they're not as emotional. Now, when you look at these two men, they have worked with women. They obviously work with men and women um, equally. Uh, they would probably say that they have no gender bias. They don't discriminate between men and women. But when you see, when you hear this and they say, even if they say it's a joke, it shows that kind of underlying biases and prejudices they might have. They might think that women are more emotional. They might think that they're not as capable as men. They might be, they might have this perception that men, if they hire a man, they would be more willing to put more work in or they they would not show as much emotion they would not be as much work uh, uh, as work to work with them so and that is going to likely and very likely to affect their their kind of decisions their hiring decisions when they're hiring for the lab or for the kitchen even if they say that it doesn't and i think this these kind of statements these words language that you put out can be quite revealing sometimes of these unconscious kind of biases and prejudices, even when we refute them, even when we say we are just joking, because these words and language matter. And when we are talking about gender equality, when we are talking about, especially in STEM, there's so much gender bias and we're talking about bringing more women and girls into the labs and into science and engineering, then this these kind of things hurt. They, these words and messages can be quite harmful as well. Um, this is this is uh, 
an example about how children form a racial prejudices and biases from a very young age. And this is this example is quite interesting because it shows that a lot of our behaviors are learned and it's not something that's hardwired within us, you know. So um, this is this is a documentary called A Class Divided. Jane Elliott was a, a sixth grade or fourth grade teacher and um, she showed how it was so easy to turn our seven year old pupils into hate mongers by making the blue eyed children the target of discrimination by the better brown eyed children. So what she did was that she divided the blue eyed brown eyed children and it's quite a con controversial experiment that, that she did, which wouldn't be allowed now ethically, but it, it, it is something that stands as a landmark in showing how these behaviors are learned very quickly by children as well. And that's something when we're having these conversations around race and racism, right now especially and talking to our children about race they, these are quite revealing um, conclusions as well so after dividing the children she told them that people with brown eyes were smarter faster and better than those with blue eyes as intelligent was a, intelligence was a factor of how much melanin we have she also gave the brown eyed children longer lunch breaks and other privileges Soon, the brown-eyed children became more confident and condescending towards their classmates, calling them stupid and shunning them in the playground. The blue-eyed children became meek and withdrawn. Her blue-eyes, brown-eyes experiment, as I said, is quite controversial, but it shows how environmental clues, cues can shape our biases and reinforce our in-group memberships. It confirmed that the prejudice against members of the out-group is learned through in children. But if it is not addressed and unlearned, we can carry these biases throughout our lives. Also, often we think that children are born colorblind, but children are not colorblind. All my research shows that they start developing a sense of race from the age of six months or so. An infant is able to non-verbally categorize people by race and gender at six months of age as they look for longer at an unfamiliar face from a different race, a different skin color here, race obviously means skin color, than when they look at someone from their own, which is familiar to them. Children start categorizing and using power-based hierarchy. So they start putting people in these that this somebody is more powerful or more beautiful or better than others. And they, these are the social cues they pick up from their parents, from the educators and the carers. So they too, at this age, they're not, the children cannot actually process all the multiple dimensions associated with the person. So they use something called transductive reasoning. And so it's easier for them to look at somebody's skin color and use that to make generalizations about their other characteristics. Children start using social cues about race and gender and observing things around them in the environment to make sense of this cognitive puzzle, assigning positive and negative salience to people and things. And they start making associations such as boys play with trucks and girls play with dolls. This also might start making some connections like people of certain ethnicity only take the bus and work in other people's houses while certain different ethnicity drives their own car. They start formalizing theories about how to behave because of their gender and which people to like and dislike. They make inferences from what they observe and conclude that these are the social norms. So this is how these kind of biases can become ingrained if we don't correct them, if we don't actively address them. And that is why a passive engagement or being a passive bystander is not really good. And so we need to really it becomes our responsibility as parents, teachers and educators to teach our children racial socialization, a strategy to understand race and racial difference. And so busting these implicit biases has to start from a very young age and ha has to be a consistent process through our adult life. We can't ignore these differences. We have to learn how to tackle them and how to treat them in a fair and equitable manner. This is an example I want to show, which is a really powerful example of how some of these biases get perpetuated through media. So these are two headlines from 
real, real newspapers during Hurricane Katrina. Um, they made a lot of news at that point, so you might already be familiar with them. In one of the examples, you see a young bl black man. He's um, walking, he's wading through these floodwaters with a 12 pack Pepsi under his right arm, holding a garbage bag with his left hand. And a caption read, a young man walks through chest deep flood water after looting a grocery store in New Orleans and so on. In the other picture, you see two white people who are wading through that, similarly carrying things, similarly with backpacks. And the caption read, two residents wade through chest deep water after finding bread and soda from a local grocery store. So this is a very powerful example of how these words and language get imbibed by people who read them. They represent the stereotypes that exist, so, but such messages can perpetuate and reinforce some of these messages as well. Because, because the journalists who did these, stud, these um, stories, they did not know the background. They did not know the context. So they relied on these kind of biases or stereotypes that already existed in their This um, is a um, study that was done in 2012 um, at University of California, in which the researcher showed pictures of 24 black faces and 24 white faces to student participants. And then following that, they blurred the white, black and white drawings of faces were used as target stimuli to show them and to respond to them. Based on this, participants were asked to rate the drawings on how threatening or how athletic they appeared. The students were more likely to judge the drawings as threatening or athletic when they had been primed with black faces rather than neutral or white faces. So facial cues are the primary motivators of how we form stereotypes, of how we assess or evaluate people, how we label them. And often, and a lot of research shows that black men, especially, they are labeled as threatening, they're labeled as aggressive. They are also these stereotypes that they are more athletic or they can dance better or sing better or all those kind of things. So facial cues are our primary kind of instigators or our primary motivators. This is a research study that was done um, at the US Naval War Academy and uh, where a large scale military data set in which over 4,000 participants and 81,000 evaluations were analyzed to examine objective and subjective performance me measures, including a list of 89 positive and negative leadership attributes for men and women. What was really interesting was that men were described using a range of positive terms such as competent, logical, analytical, while women were described as compassionate and enthusiastic. They were also asked to lab do a negative labeling thing on the negative spectrum. The only two terms that were used for men were arrogant and irresponsible, while, while for women they were around 10, including temperamental, excitable, vain, and indecisive. In the way these 28 attributes were assigned, it is clear that women leaders are judged considerably more harshly with fewer positive attributes, even when their performance on an objective scale is no difference different to that of men. So if this is indeed the case, then men, it's easier for men to become leaders, to be promoted to leaders, to be judged more kindly and perhaps more liberally than women. And so it becomes a vicious cycle because when men are seen as leaders, then there is a belief that men are better leaders. So it is also a yardstick about how we measure different people as well. What parameters we use, we don't use an objective measure to measure different kinds of people. And as we are seeing at the moment, we've seen with gender pay gap, we've seen with ethnicity pay gap as well. We've seen that we the same measure is not being used, even when people are comparable as well. And I don't know if you followed the hashtag publishing paid me recently on Twitter, if you're on social media, you would see that people, a lot of authors are revealing their advances and authors of comparable success, comparable um, kind of profiles, there is a huge gap in how much white authors are paid and how much black authors are paid. And now at this stage, I would like to say that there's a lot of intersectionality in a lot of biases as well. So when people make these kind of conclusions from these studies, 
there are often anomalies, always, always anomalies and out anomalies and outliers. So you cannot say all men are like that or all women are like that or all white or the there's never a case of all this applies to. But that is the general trend. That is the general pattern. And if that is the case, then there is a different yardstick being used for different people in our society that affects their opportunities, that affects their progress and that affects how they're perceived in society as well the status hierarchy. So I'm talking about the intersectional effect. The intersectional effect of gender and emotion is also seen in the myth of the angry black women. So I talked about earlier how um, Professor Tim Hunt or Marco Pierre White talked about how women are more emotional, but there's an intersectionality effect, which means that when gender and emotion and race combine, then it becomes more heightened. So the angry black women trope is often used to characterize or stereotype black women as aggressive, ill-tempered, illogical, overbearing, hostile, ignorant without provocation. And there's no empirical evidence that there is any difference between black and non-black women and how they experience and, exp and express anger. But this stereotype continues to persist in media and culture. This stereotype was recently highlighted by the media when Serena Williams was, was really kind of stigmatized in a lot of newspapers about how she throws tantrums on court and how she was portrayed as a child with a dummy in her mouth as well. And the same happened with Michelle Obama, actually, who was called an angry black woman on the campaign trail. And then she was accused of emasculating her husband. This was from an NPR podcast. When someone weaponizes anger against black women, it is designed to silence them. It is designed to discredit them and to say they're overreacting, that they are being hypersensitive, that their reaction is outsized. And so we see the intersectionality of these biases as well. Um, within black community, black men and black women face different kinds of stereotypes and different kinds of biases. Within the whole notion of when we talk about sexism, when race and gender intersects, there are different biases that come into play and how the effect of some of these biases can be heightened as well. So when we talk about medical care and healthcare, there are lots of studies which I cover in Sway about how there's a, there's a bias, healthcare bias, and I have an article in the Independent about as well, Independent newspaper, about how of it is it is known studies have shown that women's pain is misunderstood they're misdiagnosed they don't receive the same kind of treatment but black women face much more mortality in childbirth and and in during pregnancy they face more medical and healthcare bias than other women so there's this intersectionality effect and biases that we should be aware of as well so stereotypes is something I really focus on because I think a lot of our biases and prejudices emerge from these kind of stereotypes. They can vary in content and in salience, obviously, as per context. So, but they can be like, they have a duality effect as well. So for instance, they are these cultural stereotypes um, and that Indian parents are pushy and overbearing, but Indian parent mothers are too controlling but on the other hand, Indian mothers are also very nurturing and loving, and they keep on getting perpetuated and reinforced because of repetition, but also because of ambivalence, because there is, they're very vague, there's no clarity, and a whole community can be homogenized according to it. And I show these two things because often when we are fighting or for there's this this struggle for representation in mainstream media from a lot of minority ethnic communities. But when you see Rajesh Kutrapali, for example, in Big Bang Theory, you think, oh, at last there's a male protagonist from the South Asian community. But then you see that they are being represented as awkward and nerdy and shy with overbearing and controlling parents, are afraid to talk to girls. And that kind of creates this stereotype of what an Indian man would be like, what the families would be like. Similarly with Apu in, in Simpsons, and it's, all very amusing and it's good to have a representation uh, from a South Indian 
uh, man, family, family, but they're shown as religious with a lot of la children with large family and the way the accent is, it's culturally inappropriate to do that. And recently the person who did the um, his voiceover actually said he's not going to do it anymore because of the problematic representation. And so I think is really important, role models are really important in shattering some of the stereotypes, but actually representation can reinforce and perpetuate some of these stereotypes and biases as well. So then they contribute to the lack of understanding and this kind of irrational construction of this perceived identity of people are based on a certain kind of a certain association with a group that has been stereotyped. The whole group is homogenized. Um, sometimes people tell me, and I, I, I used to think like that as well, that positive stereotypes are good. For instance, if Asians are good at maths, or women are nurturing, or African Americans are superior athletes. We might think that some of these positive stereotypes serve to address the injustice and go towards balancing the inequalities. Um, especially with the recent emphasis on diversity and we are trying to now emphasize multiculturalism and within a lot of our personal and institutional spaces we are talking about how negative stereotypes have been harmful. There is a strong motivation to make positive statements about members of traditionally marginalized social groups. People of course find it easier to express positive stereotypes more expi explicitly too. So these positive stereotypes, which I cover a lot in the book as well, might be flattering and innocu innocuous, but they also demonstrate insidious bias. And in the case of different ethnic communities, they perpetuate the idea of model minorities. The trope that if all minorities worked as hard and were as diligent, they would be as successful as the model minority. This then creates competition and division between the different minority communities themselves. The notion of model minority also promotes the idea that the only way to gain respect and acknowledgement is to work hard, not be any trouble and accumulate an impressive list of accomplishments. And so these positive stereotypes can actually be very harmful and create more social inequality as well. <coughs> A study by um, Researchers in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology shows that positive stereotypes such as Asians are good at maths evoke negative reactions because they interfere with the desire of these people for everybody to be seen separate from their groups. So when somebody tells me you're really good at science, the underlying message being for a woman or for uh, yeah, for a woman, despite it being complimentary, it's establishing a depersonalized form of bias. When individual achievement is diminished because of the group membership and an associated stereotype, it can create anger and annoyance, as has been demonstrated in a lot of research studies with Asian American students. Of course, they are good at math, they're Asian, then becomes a call to reduce the individual to a racial group membership and devalue their achievement as something inevitable. So basically, you say we are saying that their achievement is of course taken for granted and it's because they are Asian and it kind of depersonalizes them, dehumanizes them and reduces them to a stereotype as well. Saying that African Americans are superior athletes create a misconception that any negative stereotype for these groups have been neutralized. Such notions can reinforce the idea that differences between black people and white people are biological and perpetuate the dangerous notion of race being a biologically determined category rather than a spectrum. So in this study, it also showed that positive stereotypes tend to lead to stronger negative beliefs about black people than negative stereotypes, which is a really interesting conclusion. This research also suggests that positive stereotypes may be uniquely capable at reinforcing cultural stereotypes and beliefs that people explicitly eschew as racist and harmful. A positive stereotype and a negative st stereotype therefore go hand in hand without us realizing it. A strong athletic and physical ability can sometimes equate to the incorrect assumption of lower cognitive ability or a nurturing side can be flip side to not being authoritative enough and be perceived as a le leader. 
So it's yet another form of double bind bias. And women face this double bind bias a lot in the workplaces because by saying that they are very nurturing, they're not seen as leadership material because they're not very authoritative. They don't take the lead. Um, but then if they don't conform to this supposedly feminine stereotype, their social norm, then they're seen as being too aggressive and not being nurturing enough or not being a team player. And then they're being penalized for it as well. And we see that again and again in workplaces. <coughs> Sometimes this can also lead to stereotypes such as um, young women are told that they are more creative or more nurturing than maybe more scientific. And they, that can give them the message that they might be suited to a particular career more than others. And they might forego of aspirations to enter domains such as science and technology where they feel that they might not fit in. And this is the whole idea of stereotype threat as well, which plays a huge role on how people form a notion of otherness and identity and belonging. When you step inside a domain, which you think you're not going to fit in, you don't believe, you've been told, that that is not perhaps your kind of natural home, then people carry this stereotype threat. And research has shown the stereotype threat creates anxiety, it affects performance. And so it's kind of a vicious cycle because then it affects performance. And if a woman doesn't do as well on a maths test, then it becomes the notion that women are not as good at maths than, as boys. And so it creates this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy in a way. So the UK-based study Stonewall in the 2004 report Understanding Pre Prejudice Attributes to a Minorities state that benevolent prejudices serve to justify and mask hostile attitudes and biases. For instance, gay men are stereotyped as fun caring, more feminine than straight men and into fashion, have tidy apartments and love Madonna. This is from the Stonewall charity report. And if you base it elsewhere in the world, you probably have heard of it, I'm sure. Movies and television often show them as a sidekick, the gay best friend. They can't just be dull and boring, staid and regular. They always have to be funny with an uncanny understanding of women. Not only does this create a bias that a gay person looks and acts a certain way, it also immediately isolates any young person growing up and identifying as gay who does not conform to these stereotypes. It can cause a huge crisis of confidence and identity and affect their mental health and well-being. So this kind of ambivalent, benevolent pre prejudices or biases can be very harmful as well. They can be kind of a flip side as I'm talking about and positive and neg negative stereotypes go hand in hand as well. So um, even when the stereotypes are positive, they lead to group based biases because they give out the message that people can, can assume that they know everything about a person based on the group that they belong to. They immediately put a label on a person. So this is just an example of how when sometimes would say you don't look very Indian or you are not very Indian or you don't, I didn't never guess that you were Indian or never guess that you were gay. That is also classifying people by stereotypes. And that is a microaggression and microaggressions are a form of kind of insidious kind of um incident biases coming to the forefront. And often in workplaces and social situations, we don't talk about microaggressions because we always sometimes think that a lot of our racial biases or sexist views, unless they are especially racial biases, if they are not resulting in, in kind of hate crime or if there's no such explicit violence, then there is no racial bias exists in a society. And then this creates this kind of myth of a post-racial society. It was for a while in the UK. And now we're beginning to talk about it. Um, but these kind of implicit ways that it manifests in time form of microaggressions, in form of jokes, in form of teasing, bantering, which are supposedly harm, harmless, but they can actually make the other person feel very othered, like they don't belong, create stereotype threat all those kind of things. We can affect their mental and physical health. Accenticism is not something I'm going to go into too much detail, but it's this is just 
a nice little break into the into supposedly kind of quite a serious talk about um, biases we all carry prejudices around different accents and actually there are so many stereotypes about british accent which is basically the posh uh, queen's english received pronunciation that it's very intelligent that uh, and uh, and there is also these kind of intergroup biases as well about how American accent is perceived, how a British accent is perceived, how different regional accents in Britain are perceived, how Indian accents are perceived. And they can be used to stereotype people as well. So they can be a cue as well, much like facial cues. So when people talk to me, perhaps on the phone, they hear me, they, I'm sure they make a very kind of a strong impression of what they think I am like or I would be like based on my accent and they fall back on the stereotypes of people. For a while we heard a lot of jokes around Indian accent because of the whole uh, tele sales and a lot of tele communication industry was based in India and all these call centers and so there was a stereotype around what Indian accent was like and people would regularly joke about it but these are microaggressions as well and i think microaggression understanding microaggression is always trying to step into the other person's shoes because if you can step into the other person's shoes we can understand how they might feel in that situation it might be very funny to us but it might not be very funny to the person who's experiencing it ageism is another bias that uh, is a hidden bias in our society um, the old is gold kind of thing that doesn't really apply to the older population in our society. Jokes are made at the expense of older population, showing them variously as grumpy or cuddly. Older people often teased about their cognitive abilities, ignored and not taken seriously. And there's a greater assumption that they have physical and me mental impairments. Anti-wrinkle creams and treatments crowd the shelves. In a 2004 report by Age Concern, and I've just recently actually written an article for Age um, UK, um, which is on their website, but an Age Concern uh, report showed that one in three people surveyed thought older people are incompetent and incapable. Explicit discrimination and bias are of course illegal and also frowned upon, yet implicit biases against age persist. Much like with race and gender, it takes less than a second for age-based social categorizations to take place. They happen so quickly and automatically that it is difficult to make them thoughtful and de deliberate. Variables might include cues, so we pick up cues such as wrinkle skin, gray hair, weight, posture. And when this categorization based on age leads to stereotypes, prejudice, and then it becomes discrimination against them. And this is called ageism not just older people younger people below a certain age can be discriminated against as well when we see a young person we make assumptions whether they are capable, capable of running their own business whether they have the maturity to handle a certain situation whether they have the life experience to write a book or talk about something in a deep a deeper sense so we are always this ageism is such a hidden bias in our society and again the intersectionality really affects the biases because I talk about it in Sway a lot about how older women are perceived differently to older men. Now I want to come, I know the time is of essence, so I'm going to come to the technology and bias. And one example is voice assistants and smart speakers. They have exploded in popularity. And industry researchers forecast that there'll be more voice activated assistants than people by 2021. Um, Google reports that 40% of their searches are made by voice query today. And so I cover technology and bias in really great depth and sway because that is something that we often assume that technology is free of the human biases, but that is not the case. Most of the voice assistants are female because psychology research shows how we associate authority and care with different pitch of voices. Voices of lower pitch are perceived as more authoritative by both men and women. So if you see this graph here, um, I'll come to that in a second, but it's about how we perceive, associate authority with different pitch of voices. So voices of lower pitch, like more masculine, are perceived to be both more authoritative by both men and women while higher pitch voices are associated with submissive, helpful, and caring characters. 
These are all the impressions that make the voice assistants more often female. Um, BMW had to once withdraw a sat-nav system in one of its models because a huge proportion of German drivers, largely men, but also some women complained that they did not want to take instructions from a female voice. And again, we are falling back on these norms of what a male voice and of what a female voice is and putting kind of boundaries and limits on it. But this is how research studies were done. They felt that it was demeaning to take instructions from a voice that was higher pitched and obviously belonged to a woman. They also could not trust her, her to know the correct information. Um, so for instance, this is a very interesting example of a brokerage firm in Japan, which gives stock quotes in a female voice because it's an assistant, but actually confirms the transactions in a male one, showing inherently how the technology confirms the societal norms of gender bias and then reinforces it as well. So these technologies are reflecting the gender bias in society, of course, but they're also reflecting the lack of diversity in the design team. So there's a dearth of lack of women in technology and computer programming sectors. Of course, there's a huge gender bias. So it becomes a leaky pipeline as well, where women enter these domains are less likely to reach a position where they can be influential and make decisions. We know about Silicon Valley. There's a lot of research um, that I've included in the book, but there's a lot of research in how undiverse the teams are. Um, especially the people who are making the decisions and the policies in there. So this means that many of these systems are being designed by men whose worldview is possibly one where women are submissive and coy. So that's how these women, these uh, voice assistants are designed like that. And But also there is this, this graph at the side, it shows how they respond to sexual behavior and sexual harassment. And there's a UN report. That's why my chapter is called I'd Blush If I Could. There was a UN report which was done, which showed that actually Siri was pretty bad. Um, and Alexa, when it was, when it was said you in some sexual harassment or some sexually explicit, um, instruction was given to her, it, um, it, it just said, I'd blush if I could and would not stand up or say anything to it. So this is the data which shows that sexual demands or requests, how they respond to it. So that's why how they've been designed. And that's kind of showing the reflecting the gender bias or gender inequality and these kind of social norms, but also it's going to perpetuate them in turn as well. So technology and product and system has a huge responsibility in in the way they reinforce and perpetuate some of these biases in society. This is an interesting example of um, I went to get a passport photo and this is actually from my Twitter that I posted last year. I went to get a passport photo really quickly um, and um, and I just could not get it even after 25 minutes it was supposed to be a really quick thing. It kept saying that you're smiling or you and your um your my mouth was open i tried 18 times and then i would purse my lips in a scowl but it not, did not meet the regulations it is very indicative of and then I, and I posted it on twitter um there were lots there were huge amount number of people who responded with similar kind of experiences they'd had if their hair was outside the norm, or if they had East Asian features, facial features, or if they had darker skin, these cameras are not designed to identify or differentiate between facial features when you have darker skin, which again shows how whiteness can become norm when they're designing these products and design uh, systems as well, and how that affects people when they're using them. That can have a very clear effect on people feeling that they are the other, they don't belong, they don't fit into the social norm. And so we see how our biases and prejudices can actually manifest in some ways that sometimes we don't even realize it and the effect that it has on people. <coughs> this is a um, uh, from from Sway, but this is what uh, an article I wrote for Prospect about AI's race problem. And right now, as we are talking about uh, racism and how and policing in our society, um, it showed that a 2017 ProPublica report found that an um, American computer algorithm used by courts to predict reoffending rates among, amongst criminals 
labeled the black defendants as high risk twice as often as white defendants. And I'm going to show you an image of that, of this, this algorithm. And then mislabeled the white defendants as low risk more often than black defendants. Risk assessments using scores to inform decisions about who can be set free at what stage of the criminal justice system are increasingly common in courtrooms across the US. And that's something that might happen in the UK as well. Automated systems are or can be racist because they imitate the bias and prejudice in society or the designers of these systems and the data set on which these system algorithms are trained. If the training data set is not diverse, the algorithm will fail to recognize anything that does not meet the criteria set by it. As a result, algorithmic bias, much like human bias, can create social inequity and unfairness as well. <clears throat> so this is the example that I was showing you about how this algorithm labels white men even with more offen offenses as low risk while black men are labeled as high risk even when they have less or uh, more less serious offenses. And this is a research study that's been done in the US um, and just published in 2017. So in the book, I cover a whole range of other kinds of biases, which there's no time to go into. As I said, colorism, and we talk about this kind of anti-black se sentiment in the South Asian communities. The other cognitive bias, such as accessibility bias, negative bi bias, how we are more sometimes likely to respond or believe in negative information, or we're more likely to believe in information that's given to us by people we trust or people who are part of a tribe, and that's how fake news can spread sometimes as well. Hindsight bias, when we believe sometimes in hindsight that we always knew what was going to happen, that those are some of the other biases, and a lot of these biases result in how we act in social media, how we form these echo chambers and filter bubbles, how our partisan politics work, how politicians play on some of these biases, how news spreads, how we interpret information, and all that I've tried to cover in sway, which we don't have time for right now. But hopefully this talk has given you an idea of the kind of the nature of um, unconscious bias and how it works, how stereotypes are formed, what happens in our brain sometimes, how we react to information and, and the kind of dual process theory, and also the impact that these biases and prejudices can have in the real world. And sometimes we don't even realize it. None of the unconscious bias training, what is called, can actually cure anybody of any unconscious biases. We can only take time to reflect on them, acknowledge them, being aware of them. And what we can do is try and sometimes imagine stepping into the other person's shoes, that kind of empathy or empathetic consideration which can really help us understand how the other person is feeling. And there's been research to show when nurses were asked to step into patients, kind of metaphorically step into the patient's shoes, they could perhaps they could perceive their pain and diagnose it differently rather than when they did not, when they were dissociating from them. And the debiasing also can happen if we take time with some of our decisions that are really important as well. So through through doing that, through being aware of our biases, through being aware of how insidious they can be, through being aware of how they can spread in words and language and images, we can minimize some of our biases. And that's the hope, really. And that is.